We're uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> uh, we are going to be here in 2 Corinthians 11 uh, at least until the first ship lands on Mars, which means quite a while. And because um, there's just a lot packed into the whole chapter of 2 Corinthians 11, there's a lot of things packed in there that I think are timely. For the day that we live in. We live in a day of mass deception. Okay? Mass deception. In the days uh, of, like I say, the 1800s, there was an explosion of false doctrine. Uh, you have Joseph Smith and the Mormon Church. You have Charles Taze Russell and the Jehovah's Witness cult. You have um, Mary Baker Eddy with Scientology. You have... Um, uh, Alistair Crowley, you have um, Elise Bailey, you have uh, Helena Blavatsky, you have a lot of occult writers out there publishing books everywhere, and there's just a, an explosion of false doctrine, false teaching, false preachers, and whatnot. Um, in the age of the internet, those false doctrines, I would say, pale in comparison to some of the strange things that are coming out now over the internet. Anybody that's got any kind of weird, wacky gospel or weird doctrine or whatever, they now have a voice by way of Facebook, Twitter, any kind of social media, YouTube. I mean, anybody can put up a website nowadays. And it's just, I mean, it's that easy to disseminate false doctrine. And um, I, I am of the firm idea that if you will ground yourself with the belief that every word of God is true right here in front of you, and you'll arm yourself with that, that's your shield of faith. You believe what the Bible says, not what man says. Not what man says the Bible says, but if you believe what the Bible says, then you are armed and you are ready for that onslaught of false doctrine. And um, let me just say this by way of introduction. I will never forget <clears throat> one day I was uh, pastoring out of Richwoods. And uh, my habit was on Saturdays when I studied for the message for Sunday. Because I worked all week. And, uh, and I was studying for the message on a Saturday afternoon. And the Jehovah's Witness came by my house. And they knocked on the door and I talked with them a little bit. And I thought I was armed and ready for them. And they... Handed, they, you know, stretched their arm out with their literature. And I thought, well, I'm just going to take that so that nobody else gets it, okay? I don't encourage you to do that. They're going to print millions more. They're going to outprint you by the millions, okay? So if you think you're going to take that so somebody else can't have it, they're going to make more, okay? They got whole stacks of them. I took it, and I didn't really, I, I, I thought, I decided I was going to read it so that I could figure out how they work and how they manipulate people. And I started reading through this thing. And by the time I was about two-thirds of the way through, I was thinking in my mind that Jesus wasn't God and there was no Godhead. Okay? Be because their literature is that slick. And I had to stop. And I put it down and I started praying. I said, God, you protect me from this. You protect me from this. And after I prayed and I went back to the Bible and read some scriptures and that helped a little bit, then I started, I started discerning how they were getting this to you. They were quoting Bible scholars that were not Jehovah's Witness. They were saying, Dr. So-and-so of such and such theological seminary said this. And I caught on that they were using liberal theologians that did not believe the Bible anyway. They were using liberal theologians to, that would say, nowhere in the four Gospels does Jesus ever admit to being God. That's a lie. It's a lie. But they're trying to make you think that your own church doesn't believe it anyway. They're trying to make you think that Christianity never believed it. They're trying to get you to think that the real right doctrine is the one that they're teaching. And so after, after kind of discerning a little bit how they worked, I took that literature and I 
tore it up and I threw it away. Because I, I didn't want it no more. I didn't want anything to do with it anymore. And I'm going to encourage people out there. Because some of you on the internet, you're researching a lot of things you should probably stay away from. You think that you're good enough and you're sound enough to be able to fend off false ideas and false doctrine. Unless you're absolutely 100% sure that you are, I'm going to tell you, stay away from a lot of this stuff on the internet. Because it is stealing away people's minds right and left. The devil corrupts minds. And he's been doing it a lot longer than you've been alive. That's his, in fact, that's what he says here. Your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And people are being pulled away in, in, by the thousands, having their minds corrupted from the simplicity that is in this book. The simplicity is you believe what it says, not what somebody tells you it says. And there is a big, huge difference. That's one of the tactics that the devil will use. All right, so that's just my encouragement to you today is that be careful. Don't study everything that you can think of on the Internet trying to understand how the, the Illuminati is working and how this and how that. Stay away from that stuff. Read your Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Uh, we are the bride. He, Christ is the bridegroom. And um, it is Paul's job to present us as a, as a father would present his daughter to the groom. It is Paul's job to present us to Christ as a chaste virgin. It means we're undefiled. We're, we're pure. We've not been with the devil. We've not been with, with some other man, all right? So as a, but he said, but I fear, lest by any means, underline that, any means, any website, any YouTube video, any preacher, any teacher, any radio station, any music, any, any videos, any movies, any, any, any books, anything, lest by any means, you're, uh, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And again, Satan corrupts minds. He destroys right doctrine. He devours it. That's what he does. You see that in the parable of the seed and the sower. He comes down and he devours the word. He devours the seed away from people so that that seed never has the chance to have effect in that person's life. He steals it away. So he says... Um, in verse 4, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, how are we going to identify it? That's what we're going to get into. Or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received. I've spent all week reading a book that I have about this other spirit. She is the harlot of Revelation 17, Revelation 18. She is mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. It is her spirit that pervades and dwells in the areas of false doctrine. It is her spirit that will lead people through the subtlety of her words, through the beguiling of her words. Her words are smoother than oil, the Bible says. Slick. She's very slick at what she does. Okay? But her enticing words is what leads people and draws them astray. That's the other spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted. You might well bear with him. And here again, Paul's just saying, he said, I want you to, if you're going to listen to these other people, I want you to listen to me. I want you to give me a hearing, and I want you to listen to me. I'm going to tell you the truth, good and straight. I'm going to shoot it right out to you. I'm going to just say it how it is. And then these other uh, knuckleheads are going to teach their nonsense, and then you decide whose side you're going to be on. But you can't be down the middle. You can't say, oh, I like the Apostle Paul. Boy, I like some of his stuff. But, boy, I sure like what Dr. So-and-so has to say, too. And I kind of believe in the mix of the two. And Paul's saying, there is no mix. What concord hath Christ with Belial? What agreement hath light with darkness? 
What communion hath light with darkness? You cannot mix false doctrine in with true doctrine. Although the devil will do that. You ever notice that? He will include just enough truth to lure you in, to, to hit you with what's false, to get you to believe it. It's like giving a dog a worm pill. Who never has ever tried to give a dog a worm pill? You'd be, you'd be better off trying to pull the moon down with a rope than you would be just to give a dog a plain worm pill. What do you got to do? You got to wrap it up in something nasty, gross that you would never touch, that something smelly. Bacon. Okay? Or something like that to get that dog to eat that worm pill. And I've seen dogs <laughs> spit the worm pill out. Mmm, <laughs> boy, that's good. Can I have another one of those? Okay? I'm telling you, the devil, just be careful. He will mix truth with error. That, in fact, that's his, that's his way, and we'll get into that later on, all right? So anyway, we've got to watch out for another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. We're looking into this serpent. We talked last Sunday. He is the devil, Satan. He is the dragon. Uh, we looked at him in Genesis chapter 3. I'm not going to get into uh, any of this, but I, we're going to look at the nature of the devil, the serpent, Satan, the dragon, how God uses him. Numbers chapter 21, turn there. This is where we're going to begin this morning. Numbers chapter 21. We'll note, and here's something I, I want you to bear in mind. God's purpose is fulfilled by the serpent. God will use the devil. Okay? If God couldn't use him, if God couldn't control him, God wouldn't have made him. But you need to understand something about God. God is always in control of everything and, er and everything in his creation. God is in control of it. Okay? Now, I'll give you an illustration. Um, there was a young lady that, uh, that had died. I can't remember how the relation was. Uh, Sister Waymeyer was telling me about it. And um, she was about 11, 12, something like that. And she died in her sleep. Just natural causes. They didn't have a reason for her to die. She just died in her sleep. And she had gone to three different churches in her life, so they had three different preachers preaching the message. Uh, Brother Jim Waymeyer over here at Second Baptist, he was the one who finished everything out, and I'm glad he did because he closed with the gospel, and he was giving people an invitation to accept Christ. At one time, she went to this charismatic, word, faith, name it, claim it type church, and I was familiar with a lot of their teachings. But I, I was standing in the back. It was at a vineyard funeral home. And they got a little room where the organist piano player plays. Judy Huey was sitting back there. And I was going to sing a song. So I was back there with her just kind of behind the scenes. And I, this guy got up. And my jaw just fell out of my head when he said this. His, his, they, he, and they teach this. That God lost planet earth when Adam sinned. And God's sitting up in heaven wondering how he can get custody of the earth back. And the devil's in charge of everything. And God can't do anything until you release God to, to come against the devil. And this preacher said to this room full of people that God lost a battle when this young lady died. And he lost a battle to the devil. The devil won this thing when this young lady died. And I'm just back there. I wanted to jump through that little curtain and strangle him and tell everybody, don't listen to this idiot. That's the idea that the devil's more powerful than God until you release God. Listen, God's not on my leash. Amen. Amen. God's not on my leash. He's not my servant. He's not my little go-getter. All right? But anyway, that's the idea. God, the devil doesn't use God. God will use the devil for his purposes. Let's read this. Numbers 21, verse 4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea... To compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Underline that in your Bible because you will hit that spot in life. You will hit the place where you are much discouraged because of the way. It is a le they're following the pillar of cloud. They're following God. And yet God leads them through hard ways. Why does God do that? Okay? There's some people, listen to me now, there's some people who are fake Christians.
Christians. I don't know if you believe that or not. There are some people who are fake, phony, quote-unquote followers of Jesus that just like the parable of the seed and the sower says, when the sun comes out and it gets hot and, and it gets hard, they pull back and fall away and they say, well, I, this, I'm not going to do this. This wasn't in the deal. I didn't know it was going to be hard like this. That preacher told me that I'd just name it and everything would just come to me and I thought that was going to be easy. Okay? So anyway, they were discouraged by the way. Verse 5, and the people spake against God. This is why I'm telling you this. Be careful when you get discouraged. Be careful about speaking against God. Watch yourself. Watch what you say about God. Watch what you say to others about Jesus. Watch the attitude that you have concerning God's word. Don't speak out against it. So they spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. What was that light bread they were referring to? Was that hostess? Huh? The manna. The very bread from heaven that God gave them. Do you know these same people, when the real bread from heaven came down to them, did you know that they loathed him too? Same people. Same people. Hardest, meanest people in the world are the Jews, and yet God loves them. You ought to love them too, amen? You ought to, you ought to pray for them. So anyway, our soul loathed this light bread. You know, that, that is a type of the church crowd who says, we don't believe God, everything God does is in the Bible. So we're going to things and we're saying God does it and it's outside of the Bible. And we don't really follow the Bible. And I've heard people tell me, people have told me that they have heard people say this. That people that, that would say that they have gotten so much and so high in the spirit that they don't need the Bible anymore. That's a danger, that is a shipwreck waiting to happen. Okay? What's that song we sing? I need thee every hour, most precious Lord. But I, that's, that's the idea. People don't need the churches, don't need the Bible anymore. And um, I've heard preachers talk all week. And things that they've heard, people will say that from other pastors, that they don't, they don't preach out of the Bible much anymore because this younger crowd wouldn't understand it. It is fooey on that. They wouldn't understand it. So we don't use the Bible terms. We use all these other terms out in the world. And we talk about other things out in the world and how they relate to God. But people wouldn't understand the Bible, so we don't give it to them anymore. Their soul loatheth this light bread. Okay, now you watch this. This is setting it up here. So we'll look at what happened in verse 6. And the Lord sent fiery what? Serpents among the people. And they bit the people. And much people of Israel died. I want you to think about what it is that happened with them. The serpent opened their mouth against those people. Two things come out of the mouth. Poison and poison. One is the venom like the little chemical mixture, the other is words that come out of people's mouths or spirits' mouths. When it says fiery serpents, I believe that two probabilities. Number one, the Bible speaks of fiery flying serpents, fire-breathing dragons, and I believe what the Bible says. Believe it. Because you read Job 41, God describes Leviathan right down to the very scales that are on him. This is not make-believe. This is not a myth. This is something that God created. God made him and created him. So that's that probability. The other probability is there are spirits. Spirits, angels, are made out of a type of fire. It is their substance. It is what they're made of. So fiery serpents, think devils. Think of the devil. And they bit much people. In other words, the, what proceeded out of their mouth poisoned them. 
And it caused their death. Now there's a spiritual aspect to this. So verse 7. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. Now let me stop right here. Let me give you the gist of this. Because this something's going to ring true in your mind. Have you ever watched someone's life who, who did not live their life for the Lord, turn their back on God, live for the devil, and watch the devil just consume their life away until they were gone? And that had an effect on you. Who in here has ever seen anything like that? In other words, you saw God's judgment on somebody else that you were probably a partaker with at that time. And you saw how God judged them. And it made you step back and say, you know what? I don't want it like that. God did that for a reason. God could have very well chosen you to be one of the ones that were bit by the serpent and didn't make it. God could have killed you a long time ago and been right in doing it. Amen? He could have been justified in taking your life and condemning you to hell fire for all of eternity. God would be fully justified in doing it because you broke God's law. But he didn't. But God allowed you to see the judgment of other people and it caused you to stand back and say, I don't want any part of that. God, is there any hope for me? God, can I be? Because that's what happened here. As God killed, however many people he killed on that day, as those serpents went in and bit those people, the rest of Israel standing watching those people die, knowing why it's there. And they called out to the God, they said, God, we've sinned. God, have mercy on us. Now watch what happened. Uh, take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Verse 8, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Right here, you're seeing the proto-gospel. You're seeing a, a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. Now, let me explain something to you. And I, it's a question that I asked God years ago. Because I'm looking at this and I'm going, wait a minute. I know Jesus said, as Moses lifted up serpent, we're going to go. In fact, go ahead and turn to John 4. And I said, I asked God, I said, God, does that mean that Jesus is the devil? No. Doesn't mean that at all. But in Colossians, the Bible teaches us that when Christ was on the cross, that he made a show of his enemies openly triumphing over them in it, meaning the cross. That everything that you see portrayed there from the pages of your Bible concerning the cross and Jesus dying, the crown of thorns, the stripes that he had, the fact that they stripped him of his clothes, that means that he was bearing our shame. Nudity is a picture of shame in the Bible. First thing that Adam and Eve realized when they sinned was what? They were naked. What happens to our children as we raise them? For a while, they run around the house naked. They don't care. Run around outside naked. They don't care. They don't have a problem in the world. But then, at some point, in their, as their mind develops, all of a sudden now, they realize they don't have any clothes on. And they're not just so happy running around naked. You can't get them out of the bathroom. Can't get them... Close, close the door. Don't come in here. That's what they'll say. And I think it's that at that point in a child's development that they're starting to understand right from wrong because how it's related to sin. The age of accountability. And Christ bore our shame and reproach on the cross. And he showed forth his enemies that were against us, made a show of them openly by nailing them to the cross. Well, in other words, when he died, he destroyed them. So Jesus said in John 3, he's telling this to Nicodemus, and this is right before John 3, 16. He says in verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now Jesus made a show of the devil in himself 
nailing him, having himself nailed to the cross, showing the defeat of Satan in the last days. Okay? Showing the defeat of Satan and his power over you at the cross. That's what he did. That's why he said what he said. It's type, it's, he's, he's showing the typology of Satan being defeated. Now, watch this. Back in uh, Numbers chapter 21, Moses is the one who builded the serpent and made the pulp, made it out of brass and lifted it up there. And Moses, God told Moses, tell the people this, if you get bit, look upon this, and when you look upon it, you will live. Now the people who hear that, they've got a choice. They can either refuse to believe that it's that simple and perish, or they can believe in the simplicity that is in Christ. And are, are you telling me I've got bit by the serpent and I got poison running up my leg right now. It is minutes away from my heart. Are you telling me that all I have to do is look upon that serpent on that pole and I will live? That's what I'm telling you. It's that simple. It is that simple and it kind of makes you wonder why people won't do it. Because we tell people the gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. It's that simple. And yet millions refuse to do it. They won't do it. Because their minds have been corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Do you see that? I mean, it's that simple. Look on that serpent and you look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Okay? It's that simple. And yet these people, they've got a choice. They can look on that serpent and be saved and live from being poisoned. Or they can refuse to believe that and say, I don't believe that kind of nonsense. I'm a self-made man. I'll heal myself. Did you know that there's people out there, there are churches and, and false doctrine out there on YouTube and everywhere else where people are, are in, in a sense, telling everybody it is up to you to heal yourself from your sin problem. It is up to you to change your mind and your life and to change your habits and to change all your thinking and to change all your ways. It is up to you to do this. And if you don't do this, then you won't be saved. If you won't change yourself, then you won't be saved. And there are people out there who are telling that kind of stuff when the truth of it is... I know beyond any doubt whatsoever that I have zero ability to change my life. I've tried it, been trying it, keep trying it. And I can tell you that the changes that have been made in Mike Hoggard since his birth have all been made by God, not me. Why? Because I just believed how simple it was to say, God, will you change me? God, please remake me. David's prayer, uh, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. David was not telling God, God, I promise that I will never look on another woman ever again. That is not what David said. David realized that he could not make that promise to God, and neither can you. You're not capable of it. God is the one who makes the change. God is the one who brings the healing from the serpent bite. Amen? Now, turn your Bible to um, Deuteronomy 32. Let me show you. We're going to talk about the, the poison this morning. The devil's poison. What is that? What is this? What was the poison that came out of his mouth? If we were to, I'm not going to have you do that, but if you remember from Genesis 3, here's the serpent in the garden, and he does not bite Eve. That serpent in the garden, and remember, this is what this is about. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. The serpent in the garden did not bite Eve and inject poison into her that caused her to go eat that fruit. But it's the same kind of poison, and it came out of the exact same place. It came out of his mouth. Words can be just as much poison, if not more poisonous, 
certainly than any serpent in the state of Missouri. I'm told that there is not a snake in the state of Missouri whose bite absolutely means you're, you're dead. Okay? It'll make you sick. Now, I'm not sure if I trust that. That doesn't mean that I feel confident enough to go handle snakes. Okay? But, I, you know, we don't, there are snakes that are far more poisonous in this world than the ones we have in Missouri. I'll say it that way. Okay? But I can tell you that there are words that come out of devil's mouths through people that are far more poisonous than any serpent in this world in that they don't just kill the body. They kill the soul. Deuteronomy 32, verse 24. They shall be burnt with hunger, devoured with burning heat. This is God's judgment upon the people who will not listen and, and keep His laws. And with bitter destruction. And I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of the poison of serpents of the dust. And then down in verse 31, same chapter. For their rock is not as our rock. You've heard me talk about this many times. Even our, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom. And of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Verse 33. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Uh, look, up on, look up on the screen here real quick. It's amazing to me that we have rock groups called poison and venom. Let me tell you something. Music poisons minds. Lyrics in music I, and I've, I, I had it in my mind last night. I'm going, isn't there some rock groups called Poison and Venom? Sure enough, there was. And when I was looking into them a little bit last night, I was looking at some of the lyrics of their songs. And I want to tell you what, they came right out of the sulfur pits of hell. I mean, anti-Christ lyrics in music. Um, listen, I want to get into that. Don't have time. But I, I've been, I have known... For most of my life, being raised in this church, that a vast portion of popular music, be it rock and roll, rhythm and blues, rap, heavy metal, or even a lot of country music, the words that are spoken in those songs are poisonous to a Christian's life. Okay? Okay? Saying things that, number one, should not be said. Teaching things that ought not be taught that are detrimental to the faith of someone who claims to believe the Bible. And we know it. I don't have to preach this to you. All you got to do is go back and remind yourself of the lyrics of some of your favorite songs back in the day. And why you liked them so much. Am I right, Scotty? Am I right, Mike? Okay. Sis, am I right? Okay. They're poison. Pure poison. But anyway, their wine, Deuteronomy 30, 32, 33, their wine is the poison of dragons, the cruel venom of asps. Two types here. There's, there's the vine of Christ, there's the vine of Sodom that produces wine. The wine of Christ is the Holy Spirit, the new wine. Non-fermented, does not have leaven, that corrupts it. Because a little leaven, leaven is the whole lump. It's leaven in the grape juice, yeast, that devours the sugar out of the grape juice and releases methyl alcohol into that grape juice and brings drunkenness. They've destroyed the sweetness of the wine, of the new wine. Just a little leaven. And I can tell you, and I may do this, there's a whole thing, a teaching I have on how wine and strong drink are related to false doctrine in the Bible. You look it up, strong drink. You look that up, and you just take it all through the Bible, and you'll see it. False doctrine. Why? Because their wine is full of the poison of dragons. And we're going to understand what that means. 
Turn to Proverbs 23. How much time do I have? Probably not enough. Mm, 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 mm. Proverbs 23, verse 31. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Red, in the Bible, the color red. Think of, some, think of something in the Bible that's red. Blood. Think of something else in the Bible that's red. Though your sins be... They should be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they should be as wool. Okay? Think about that. Anyway, when it uh, giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, at the last, it does what? Biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder, and flies like a butterfly, and stings like a bee. No, that's... Thine eyes... Watch this. Thine eyes shall behold who... Strange women, there's your clue right there. Strange women represent that other spirit that Paul warned us about. Mystery Babylon the Great, the harlot women. Now, and I shall behold, what, I mean, what do guys do when they go to bars? What do guys and women do when they go to bars? They drink and they look at each other. Where's their wives and husbands? Somewhere else. They drink and they look at each other. Why? Their judgment's gone. Their discernment's gone. The alcohol has affected the portion of their brain that makes moral choices. And they're not going to make moral choices. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. You can just about tell when a preacher has been drinking... Let me just say it this way. Can you tell when someone's been drinking wine by the way they talk? Also, you can tell when a preacher, a prophet, a priest, religious leader of some kind has been drinking from her wine, from the poison of dragons, by what comes out of his mouth. You hear the doctrines, you hear the teachings, and they're perverse. They are perversions of what this book says. And that's how you know that that person has been drinking from the wrong cup of wine. Okay? That was the bell. Well, we're going to pick it up here next Sunday. Study strong drink. Study wine. Study strong drink out of the Bible. All right? Did Jesus, didn't Jesus make alcoholic wine? No. Jesus drank wine. And you know people do that. You know people that say that. You know what they're looking for? A reason to drink. That's all they're doing. Looking for a reason to drink. I've heard it. I've heard it all before. I take a very strong stand against alcoholic beverages. And always will. You want to justify it, you go ahead. But don't use the Bible to do it because you can't. Father in heaven, teach us right ways, O oh God. Give us a right heart, a right attitude. God, we cannot. I, Lord, I, I cannot change myself. I've tried. tried everything I can think of. Can't do it. God, you've changed me. You've made the right changes in my life, Lord, to make me what I am. So, Father, all the praise and all the glory goes to you. And Lord, teach us your ways. Teach us, Lord, to avoid this other spirit. To be careful about the wiles of the devil. About how he works. How he affects people's lives. And the poison, God, that comes out of his mouth. That will kill us, not just in a limited way physically on this earth. But kill us everlastingly. Father, just teach us some good things, and thank you, Lord, for the book that we have that will show us these things. Bless and honor your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.